doing Burlington, New Zealand, YouTube, Facebook, all you guys. Um, today I get the privilege of um, interviewing a man I admire a lot, um, Lewis E. Scott. Um, he's got the African shop in Wellington, he's been around the world, mentoring me with my book coming out, and um, with my move to LA happening in nine months, he's really helping me just balance myself out. So let's go ahead and meet the man. Come on. <laughs> Come on with me, let's do this thing. So um, the shop, um, all these uh, beautiful African artifacts. Um, I know I'm in New Zealand, a lot of you do know that I'm African by birth. So yeah, we're celebrating our Africanism and our creativity and also our cuteness. So we'll so bring it together. This is the man himself. Brother, how you doing? I'm good, Scott. Okay. I don't know where to begin. You've got a, a, a large amount of um, written material. You've traveled the world. So I guess the best place to start is who's the man who brings the madness behind the pen? <laughs> well, as you know, I was born in Cordell, Georgia. It's a little small country town, about 170 miles from Atlanta. And at that time, in the 1940s, uh, Cordell was still, Ju America period, was still segregated. So my family left Georgia and went to New Jersey in search of the promised land. And so I came out of um, an environment where I was going to a Baptist church school, which wasn't really a proper school, and then arrived in New Jersey for the first time going to a proper school. So then that became the catalyst for me in terms of a writer, that you had this young Southern boy of 12 years old coming into New Jersey in a very urban, sophisticated area. Didn't relate to any of the kids, black or white. <laughs> you know? Imagine, trust me. So the escape for me was words. You know, that, that poetry became a thing. That was it. That was, uh, uh, that was a bridge, if you like, for me. The friends, the bridge, the expression. Yeah, it's a bridge. Yeah. Um, and New Zealand. How'd you end up in New Zealand? Well, see, this is really a long story. Um, in 1967, I got drafted from Vietnam. When I came back from Vietnam, I made a conscious decision that I was going to leave America at that time. And the person that had influenced me the most was James Baldwin, you know, probably one of the greatest writers that ever lived. And he had um, written a book called The Fire Next Time, uh, Just Above My Head, uh, no name on the street, and Bill Street could talk. And, and this guy was living in Paris. So, you know, as a young writer, I thought, hey, I'm going to Paris because Richard Wright had lived there. Richard Wright had did a book called Native Son. So you had this, this gathering of African-American writers who had gravitated to Europe, but not just writers, but musicians. And that came all the way up to, even if you look at Quincy Jones, Quincy lived in Europe for many years. France and America. France, France and, and, uh, and uh, Switzerland, and um, well, he lived all over basically. Al Jarreau lived in Germany for a number of years. So there was this artistic community that was very much alive. So I thought, well, okay, I'll just go and plug into that. So that was my initial leaving the States, spending about three years hanging out in Europe with all these various writers, and also it was the first time of actually meeting African writers. Uh, because when you look at the connection with France and colonize and West Africa and all that kind of stuff. So there was all these writers there, so there was an incredible base. And then um, I ran out of money. And a good friend of mine <laughs> told me, the, story. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is be broke in Paris. So this guy told me the best place to go if you have no money is either you go to Morocco, which was very cheap for him, or you go to Greece. But at the time that I went to Morocco, everybody was smoking. So then I left the went to Greece. And, and that was uh, an incredible place. And I met a bunch of New Zealanders who were in a band. There was a group called Manfoot Man. And Shona Lane was the, the backup or the opening singer for this group. And they had a, a thing called Red Mole. And there was people, there was a combination of poets and musicians. And I met these guys there, and that was the first time I had seen everybody had their skinny dipping, and taking their clothes off, and act like everybody loved everybody. So I thought, okay, hey, I'm going swimming too. But <laughs> so they suggested, well, you must come to New Zealand because it's a you know it's a country, it's a multicultural society that works equally for all. So I thought, well, I have to see this. 
Mm -hmm. So I applied for a job. I came here. And at the time that I arrived in 1976, the very first time I came to New Zealand, the government here was banging on the people doors who did not look like New Zealanders. They were doing these dawn raids. And the sense of saying that the Pacific Island people who were supposedly here undercover and all that kind of stuff. But the political thing behind that was that the economy in New Zealand was beginning to go down. So they no longer needed these guest workers. So they were going around banging on the door. Prior to that, they were encouraging all these you know, various other activities uh, developed at that point. Okay, I understand this. I've got um, some of his Stop for two saying. seconds. I've seen a double check something. Okay. It's not making the right sound. Hello there. Uh, I'm finding yourself. Please, please. Yeah, we're off and running. So uh, what would your message be to aspiring young writers and musicians? As you know, uh, I'll be off to America in yes, nine months yeah. to take on the musical world and recognize you in New Zealand. <laughs> but, um, what would you, uh, what would your advice be? I would say that any, any young writer, I would suggest that first of all read James Baldwin and listen to what this man has said because he said he's a witness. You know, a writer has to reflect what is happening in his or her society at that time. You have to be a witness to that. And to do that, it has to be about truth. It can't be about the nuances of truth. It has to be about truth. It cannot have any form of duplicity in there. There's enough duplicity in the world as it is now. If writers, and I also said to young writers, forget about the idea about fame. Okay, because I honestly believe that if you pursue fame, it means you do compromise what you're about. Because it means that you have to concentrate on trying to get your work out there on a large scale. And to get your work out there on a large scale, you have to put certain elements of a commercial value to it. When you look at hip hop or rap, when they first start jumping off in places like Chicago and New York, those guys were not concerned about being published. They were on the street corner rapping about what was going on in that community. And then someone sort of said, oh, there might be something here. So then when you got these big record companies started getting interested in that music, not only did they want you to be bad and corrupt and messed up, but they want you to start calling all women bitches and whores. You know, whereas before, those brothers who were rapping, they were sort of saying, protect this queen in your community. Protect this queen because she is like your mother. She is like your sister. Protect this queen. Don't be calling the queen a bitch. And, um, yeah, I've been having difficulty with that in my music, but uh, yeah. you've heard me on more um, artistic, like poem mm -hmm. flowing on an on a, on a instrument. And, mm -hmm. um, that's actually something that's going to be very interesting about um, to the States where uh, because I wasn't a stereotypical um, American wannabe uh, mm -hmm. musician, I wasn't getting uh, airplay and recognition. And so we just took it to the internet and the streets. And uh, I def that's definitely something that got to me about the honesty, about the mm -hmm. art, the craft. Yeah. So, you, I, I, the person who wants to write, the person who wants to paint, the person who wants to dance, the person who wants to sing, try to remember what took you there in the first place that there was some sort of need in you, that you wanted to express that creativity and reflect what you saw where you lived in the society that you're a part of. And remember that. Remember what took you there. And most of the time, if you can keep that in mind, it, it, it comes from an honesty. You know, because that's normally, if you look at a person's life, whether that person is a writer, or a musician or whatever, it's normally around about the age of 12 that if the person is going to be a dancer, he may like, he see a tree moving, he thought, man, look at the way that tree moves. I wonder, could the, could the body do that? Ooh. You know, even as a 12-year-old kid, so you're not saying you want to be a dancer, but something about the movement of that tree, okay? You might hear a, a sound, you know, somebody's walking down the street and they may bump into a pole that may slip on their shoe, yeah. Like that. Miles Davis always said that your ears should always be open to whatever sound is happening. Because he said, when I was a kid, the way they closed the car door then and the way they closed it night makes a different sound. So when you start playing music, if you're going to pick up the sounds of your environment, 
you have to know the sounds of your environment. So the writer has to reflect. The writer, and, and the writer does have a responsibility. If you say that you are a writer, you're taking a position that you're saying to somebody, I am going to examine, I'm going to look, I'm going to listen, I'm going to study, and I'm going to try to say something about what we are doing as human beings, good, bad, or indifferent, and try to bring that to a conscious level. Something I was trying to lie down. One thing I'm finding difficult when it comes to, uh, I've got different bands that range from about 13 to about 40 music bands, but it's uh, the kids that have been trying to reach and inspire the most. And it's hard to um, to explain to them the relevance of opening the mind in a certain level of education to be as mm -hmm. um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, <coughs> Some way or another, they will have to understand the idea that given the nature of the world the way it works now, that if you do not have a core basic education, you're going to have some serious problems in this world. I'm not saying that everybody has to go out there and pursue PhDs, okay? But I'm also saying that some sort of arrogance rejection of education, because you're saying, I'm, I'm out here doing my thing on the block, and you know, I'm not going to let education pollute me. No, sorry. Um, there's nothing wrong with education. And when you have young kids who believe that the greatest thing they have is their reputation on the block, on the street, you know, that they're bad, you can predict from day one where that person is going to wind up. You know what's going to happen to that person. Jail, death, drugs. That's it. One of them. That's it. Definitely. Um, or he's going to wake up, you know, at 45, 55, whatever the hell it is, totally consumed with frustration and beating everybody, his wife, children, and everybody else. Because that he doesn't know how to break out of that prison that he put himself in as the telephone rings. <laughs> yeah, we're locked in by this thing, too. You know? <laughs> Mike Moore said, the modern-day handcuff is his watch and the telephone. And you can take that in the Good afternoon, Quasi. So, yeah. How you doing, Mr. Yates? Those two is where we need to be. Oh, uh, yeah. Just uh, one or two more questions and okay. we'll be done. So yeah, we're back again, and uh, just finishing off uh, where we started. Um, spoken about the poetry, music, honesty, inspiring. Um, the of your poems. Uh, which one would be your favorite, or which one would you say has the most uh, relevance to? One of the poems that have constantly come back to me. There's two, and one is too long to do here. But the short one of that is called, As I Go Through Life. As I go through life, I will at least make six good friendships. So when I die, I will not have to walk to my grave with six strangers complaining about the heavy load. And that's the kind of poem that comes at, you know, three o'clock in the morning. Hard time. <laughs> you, know, you know, that, that sort of thing. You know, it's, uh, or, you know, if you might, Another poem. I mean, so that's a poem that you do at three o'clock in the morning. There's a politically structured poem that you might do. My father to be sits in the cold living room in the dark. My mother to be lies awake in the dark cold bedroom waiting for him. She knows why he's sitting in the dark. She knows what will happen when he comes into the bedroom, and what words she will have to say to him. Like her mother and her mother's mother. They have always known what words to say in times like this. She knows, as her mother and her mother knew, that those words they pass down to each other to give their men in times like this are but lies. Lies to keep that marcel of life in their men from total death, just another day, a minute. So she lies as her mother and her mother did. My father-to-be strikes out in the darkness at himself. My mother-to-be hears the door open, He's standing near the bed. The covers are slowly being pulled from over her body. 
She fills his hands. She reaches for his body. There's a moment of pain as a part of him pushes his way into her body. She holds on as he tries to go deeper than there is to go. It is time to say the words, yes, God. It is time to say the words her mother and her mother said at times like this. Yes, the lie. Speak the lie. Now, nah, woman, speak, speak, speak. Things will be better tomorrow. The seeds of my father-to-be and the seeds of his father and his father rush toward the eggs of my mother-to-be. The seeds move toward the eggs fast, faster with all the bitterness, fear, hate, shame, madness, sorrow, humiliation, the decay of the soul, that morsel of life that wants to grow and live. The seeds are coming to make me, to make me. They have left the body of my father-to-be. The seeds are coming, 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 crying out, I am, I am, I am, I am a man. A woman cries out as the child she has given birth to tears his head from between the darkness of her legs. The cries of the woman soften as the child pulls itself deeper into life. The line is cut. The beginning of the end is over. It is a man-child, the word is spoken after the blood is washed away. Now he must walk into life. The afterbirth has given up all claim on him. Walk him, walk him, walk him like a mad man in search of a self to live with. So <laughs> okay. uh, we've taken up a lot of your time. Uh, there's just uh, one last thing. Uh, Oh yeah, we need to talk about that. Oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> um. <clears throat> okay, you want to hang on to that? And hello there. Hello. Yeah. Okay. okay, so you want me to talk about the? <clears throat> well, maybe you should send me. Well, what's happening at the ballroom cafe? <laughs> <laughs> So um, we have one coming up, uh, what's happening at the, the, at the ballroom? ballroom Cafe? The whole premise behind the Ballroom Cafe is to create a space, one, where I guess you can say well-established writers will come and share their knowledge with young writers who are just beginning their journey. Uh, it's a space where it is not where people will be criticized but encouraged. It's a place that we, we want it to feel like a big womb when people come there that they're coming there to, to experience the birth of what they want to create and exchange that with other writers who have already gone through that birth and can bring some knowledge to what's outside of that womb once you came into this world, come into this world. And then how you go about trying to express that and translate that. So the Ballroom Cafe, it's there for people who are saying that they simply want to come and be a part of the creativity of humankind. Definitely privileged to be a part of it. I don't, I don't know if I'm bringing the, that <laughs> energy of mine, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a privilege to, yeah. to be there. I met the poets, they're amazing. Yeah. Um, appreciate being mentored by you. Uh, it's, um, it's a wonderful space. Yeah, yeah. When I was reading and doing the research, and I just saw Nikki Giovanni, uh, one of the greatest poets of our time, uh, saying the thank you for the poetry. I was mm. like, oh. Yeah, I mean, I work, I work with Nikki Giovanni, Gwendolyn Brooks, Ishmael Reed, um, Darlie, Hatha Mahabuti. Um, I mean, there's a host of these writers. And, and they're people who are well established, but they're generous with their time. When I was a young writer coming out, you know, people like Gwendolyn Brooks, who was the first African American to win a Pulitzer Prize, this woman was just available to everybody. You know, if she gave a reading, she would stand there two hours talking to every student, that, that's, that make sure those students felt like that they had her attention. And I think if you, if, if you ever become a, a well-known writer, if you need a, you know, a, an example, look at Gwendolyn Brooks. This woman would miss the airplane to make sure every young child had a chance to talk to her. That's a gift. That's a power. That's a writer. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely learning that I've met uh, some people who are definitely, without doubt, are going to be future legends, um, athletes, mm -hmm. uh, musicians. It's definitely a mentoring yeah. attitude that needs to start uh, the trend and stuff more in society. We think of uh, society's really made people. I, 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 I. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, absolute pleasure interviewing you. And, um, Thank you. Um, All right. I should be lucky in nine months. And, uh, I do, I do, I do. I would definitely wish you luck over there. I'll give you some contacts before you.
for coming. I definitely yeah. appreciate it. All right, we're cooking. <laughs>